Welcome everybody on behalf of the Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum. This morning, I am pleased to welcome you to our discussion with Lou Fogelman, a Holocaust survivor from the Netherlands. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA is the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust, and this memorial eventually became Holocaust Museum LA. These survivors who established our museum did so with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. Furthermore, they mandated that our museum should always be free to the public, making a Holocaust education accessible to everyone. While we are not able to be in the museum's physical space for the time being, we are still able to carry forward their mission. This morning, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Lou Fogelman, who will share his story with you. After Lou shares his story, you can type in your questions in the Q&A box or those watching on Facebook in the comments, and he'll answer as many as possible. Lou has been speaking at our museum for quite some time now, for the last few years, and his aunt, Betty Cohen, who he will be mentioning in his story, has also been involved in our museum. And so this family is such an important part of our community. And we are so grateful to have you as a part of our community and to be with us this morning to share your story community. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And it's my honor to welcome you. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate that. So you want to click on share screen. Yeah, I'm going to do it now. Here we go. Yeah. And then, can you see it? No, not yet. Do you, do you see the PowerPoint where you double click? Or do you see, when you click on share screen, do you see a small version of your PowerPoint? Uh, it's on, more, on my one screen, but it's not, it's, you're not seeing it, huh? Yeah, so if you click on share screen, you should see a small window with your. Uh, let's start it all over. Yeah, right. Okay, share screen is on. Okay, and when you click on share screen, do you see a small version of your PowerPoint presentation? Uh, I, no, not really. Okay, and is your PowerPoint presentation open on your computer? Yes, it is. Okay, why don't you click on that for a second and then go back to the Zoom, that might help. Okay, yep. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so that's that's working now. Um, okay. if you, your, I see your PowerPoint at the bottom of your computer. Do you see the, the bottom? Yeah. On the, the bar at the bottom? Yes. The, no, the, the, that one. Yes, click on that. Oh. Oh, you know, yeah, there it is. Okay, now if you, um, there should be a. You are sharing server. Yeah, it's, sharing. it's working. If you go on display settings at the top, do you see display settings? Yes. Click on that. Okay. And then um, duplicate. It says swap presenter view and side view, and then duplicate. Oh, side. you know what? It might be. So we can see it. It's just a little small. If you maybe want to go to the towards the bottom next to the pencil. Yes. Yeah. Try clicking. Maybe see what that does. Uh, no, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Double click on the first slide. Yeah. Um, okay, well that that should okay. work. And maybe try the yeah, right I had to go try back. the the three dots at the bottom. It's okay. And um, no, okay. Sure. Well, see what the, what the one next to it does. 
the one next to it. That kind of makes everything dark, I think. Okay. Like. Yeah, see what that does. The, no. Okay, well, you know what? This is working right now. We can see it. It's just a little small, but that's okay. Can you sure? If I went to uh, slideshow. No. Um, oh, we will. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's perfect. You've got it. Yeah, but it doesn't show me my next slide, but okay. Oh. It makes it a little bit more difficult, but. Okay, we'll if you would way. rather. Okay. Whatever is easiest for you. If you, let's see. It is, I don't, I don't let me go back. Oh, you know what, you know what, Lou, if you want, if you click on, do, do you see where it says show presenter view? Oh, if you right click again. Yeah. And then do you see show presenter view? Yes. Click on that and okay, then that way it'll show you the next slide. Okay. Uh, and then you can use the arrows at the bottom, at the bottom. Right. Okay. Go back. Okay. Right. Thank you so much, Lou. Now we're, we're, now we're set. And you have the full picture, right, Michael? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you all for uh, joining me today. Uh, as you can see, my name is Louis Corpa Fogelman, and uh, I'm a child survivor of the Holocaust. I am actually a, a product of, of the Holocaust. Holocaust. I was I was born in the Netherlands. Um. Yeah. Okay. You click on the the arrow pointing forward. I did that, and then we didn't uh, do oh. it until I. That's okay. I don't know. Anyway, I was born in 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 the Netherlands, which is right uh, above uh, Belgium, next to uh, Germany. Uh, and uh, Netherlands is also known as Holland. I was born in uh, in Hilversum, which is about 20 miles outside of Amsterdam, which is one of the main cities uh, in uh, in Holland. And uh, I was born on uh, June 21st, 1941, and my name was uh, Louis Corper. My dad was Israel Corper. He was from Holland. My mom, her, she, her name was Herta Sarah, Sarah Solomon. She was born in Trest, Germany. My mother's family, this is my mom's family. This is my mom, her oldest sister. My mom's family sent their oldest daughter, Elsie, to Paris, France in 1938 in hopes of getting a visa to go to the United States, which she did. Her name was Elsie Solomon and we'll be talking more about her uh, later on in, in the discussion. The family sent their youngest daughter, my mom, to Holland in 1939, also in hopes to get a visa to come to America. They did this because uh, it got so bad for the Jews in Germany at that, at that time. In Holland, life was good for my dad and the family. There was his father and mother and his brother, Jacob, older brother, and his younger sister, Rebecca Corper, or Betty, Aunt Betty, and uh, there were also three uncles and their wives and lots of cousins, all, all living in uh, Hilversum. And the family owned and operated a sanitary supply company by the name of Hommel. Hommel was my mother's maiden's, maiden, maiden's na name. Uh, we, they sold bathtubs, sinks, toilets, etc. in Hilversum. Man, many members of the family worked in the business, including my father. In May 1940, the Germans invaded Holland and in three days occupied the country. Didn't really take very long, it's a small country and had a very small army. At first, there was very little change for the Dutch people, but bit by bit, the Germans made life very difficult for the Dutch Jews. The Jewish children weren't allowed to go to school anymore. 
And after that, the Dutch Jews weren't allowed to work anymore or even own their own business. At times became, as times became more difficult for the Dutch Jews, it became apparent that the chance of my mother's receiving a visa to go to the United States was nil. It also became apparent that my mother, not being a Dutch citizen, could be deported back to Germany. The rest of my mother's family in Germany was all gone by then to the camps. Fortunately for me, my mom and dad had met in 1939 at a, at a dance which were held almost every weekend in Amsterdam or sometimes in Hilversum. They were held in the ballrooms of, of the hotels. Dancing was a big part of the social scene during those days. And my parents, they had met and fell in love. But my mom still wanted to go to America to join her sister. With no chance of getting a visa and the possibility of her getting back sent, her, her getting sent back to Germany, my mom and dad decided to get married, which they did on August 21st, 1940. This is them getting, uh, walking to City Hall to get married. This is them getting married. The uh, Paulus was the Hoppe and uh, and, and so they got married on the 21st. But my mom told my dad, it's okay to get married, but she didn't want any children under the circumstances, obviously because of the war. This is my uh, dad's parents uh, at the wedding, uh, my grandmother and uh, my grandfather, Levy Corper. Who is who I am named after? I'm named Lewis Hope, um, Lewis Corper after my grandfather. So and my mom said no children because of the war, but uh, lo and behold, ten months later, here I came on June 21st, uh, 1941. Kind of ironic that uh, my mom's sister, Elsie, who already had gone to America and uh, had, had met her future husband, Ike, uh, in America and got married. And she had a son uh, named Alan, uh, in, uh, actually born in Brooklyn, New York. And Alan was born on June 21st, 1940. And here I am, born June 21st, 1941. So it's pretty ironic that the two sisters, you know, con two continentals apart, and uh, one year uh, later, had uh, each had a son, both born on the same day. Here I am coming back uh, from the hospital, joining my parents. First slide is. Uh, my mother and uh, holding me with the nurse. Second slide is my dad. And the third slide is my mom and dad. And uh, me along with my uh, cousin Luke, who was the son of uh, Jacob, uh, the oldest uh, sibling of my dad and uh, my Aunt Betty. Uh, Luke was also named after our grandfather. Uh, and uh, he, he, he grew up in, in, uh, in Hilversum and stayed there the whole time. My parents and I lived in Hilversum for about a year and then the Germans started to move all the Jews in Holland to Amsterdam to the Jewish quarter. There, there would be many families living together in small quarters. The Germans wanted all the Jews living together so they could better control their activities. Also by this time, all Jews, Jewish persons 
had to wear a yellow star on their clothing, including children, so they could be easily identified as being Jews. In August 1942, the family, my mom and dad, me as a 14 month old baby, also my dad's parents and his sister Betty with her fiance Al and Oppie, I mean, his name was Oppie in Holland, but translated it's Al, and his brother and sister with her husband were all living together in the Jewish quarter. The family decided that, uh, that we should try to make our way to the Swiss border down here because the Swiss border was still open. It was decided that my parents, that my parents and me would be would go first since I was just a baby, and if that and if we had made it, they would follow a couple of weeks later. So they hired a guide to take us to the Swiss border, but instead the guide turned my mom and dad and me over to the Nazis at the train station in Amsterdam. This took place on August seventh. 1942. In July of 1942, the Nazis took over a live theater in Amsterdam where they assembled Jews to, that had been picked up. At the Hollandish Schomburg Theater, which is the scene that you're looking at now, there was seniors, adults, and children waiting their deportation to Westerbrook, a deport, deportation camp in Holland before they were shipped by train and cattle cars to concentration camps throughout Germany and Poland, such as Auschwitz. It was chaotic and crowded in the Schramsburg and the children were there, were there for taken to a daycare center across the street because the children made so much noise. As the Jews were shipped out to Westerbrook, the children were taken from the daycare center and given back to their families to go with them. So th th this is the theater, which today is actually a museum honoring the families that, that went through this. This is the back uh, the, where the auditorium was and is part of the museum and the front of the museum that we had a picture of just earlier is, is, is in this part. Also, when you walk into the museum uh, on the right hand, on the left hand side wall is a list of, of names uh, of the families, the names of the families that went through the theater and uh, so they listed all the families may a uh, surname on this wall and uh, you can see this is the uh, name of corpor here covering my dad my mom and and myself so on August 7th, my parents and I were sent to the theater, and from there I was separated from my parents, never to see, feel, or smell them ever again. I never knew how I got from the day, daycare center to the resistance fighters. My Aunt Betty thought that my parents pinned a note on me telling them where to take me, but that didn't really hold a lot of water because you would think that the Germans would be able to see that. This is a picture of uh, some of the children and nurses at the daycare center across the street from the theater. I actually took this photograph from uh, hanging on the wall at the museum just to uh, kind of illustrate uh, the, the children in the nursery school across across the street. Uh, many years later, 
actually in, in 2014 to be exact, I found out what really happened to me at the daycare center. In June of 2014, I got a call from Aunt Betty, very excited. She said she found the person who had saved me from the Schomburg Theater. She said she was coming right over to show me. In a flash, she was there showing me the cover of a magazine of an old couple on the front. The magazine is called, I'm not good at pronouncing it, but you could see the name of Anna Sprock. It's a bi-monthly magazine and is sent out to Dutch people who were in the resistance or Holocaust survivors. The old couple was Sini Kemp Cohen and her husband, Harry, and inside, it told the story of Sini Kottenberg. That's her maiden name. That was her maiden name and how she saved over 6,000 Jewish children. In 1941, at the age of 17, Sini and all Dutch children were not allowed to go to school anymore, as I said earlier. She was told by a friend that she could get a job as a nursery teacher in a nursery opposite the Schomburg Theater. Sini worked inside the building permanently 24 hours a day, sleeping in the attic. Sini was responsible for the babies and toddlers aged from zero to four. Every week, the director of the nursery was given a list of people due to be deported to Westerbrook. Sonny Sini was given the job of asking parents whatever they wanted to, to when, whatever they wanted to give up their child. She had an armband signifying and she had permission from the Germans to go between the theater and the nursery. She told the parents that they could opt for their children to go into hiding. Many parents did not want that, replying, no, we are young, strong, we can look after our children. Others said, make sure they are placed in good, with good people. If they agreed, that their child should go into hiding, she seemingly prepared them to, for it. Instead of your baby, she would bring a doll wrapped in a blanket so no one could see it. She told them if anybody wanted to see the baby, tell them it's asleep. This way the numbers added up when the Germans counted. You know, the Germans are very strict on keeping everything precise and they and they had to make sure that uh, everything co coordinated. Uh, you know, I, 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 after I read the story, I, I was just was kind of mesmerized. And, and, and with the help of, of Andre, who was my, one of my, my boor, war brothers, uh, I tracked down the author of, uh, of this article and got Simi's uh, tel address and telephone number. And in August of uh, 2014, I, I, I called her up on the phone and told her who I, who I was. And, and I, she just had the most incredible voice and, and enthusiasm that just came across the phone. I mean, her, her voice sounded so angelica. It, it, it really was. A, it was the voice of an angel, and 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 uh, I, I we you know we talked and told her a little bit about me, and she told me otherwise, and so forth. And and uh, we made plans to uh, my wife and I to come to Holland and to meet Simi and her husband in, in person in, in February of uh, two thousand. 15, uh, we had the opportunity to come to Holland and we uh, met Simi and her and a husband and it was just a, a glorious uh, meeting and, and you know, I, I don't have words to describe uh, how, how it felt, but it, it just felt just so warm and good and, and she just radiated with, with love. 
uh, and and uh, I was, you know, which I was just so happy to to meet somebody who had, who had, had saved me under such circumstances. Uh, we went back to her apartment uh, uh, with Harry and 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 her sister had her sister excuse me her daughter had prepared uh, lunch for us and uh, so my wife and I and see me and her family we sat down and had lunch and talked and and really got to know each other and uh, over the next three or four years uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to go back to Holland quite a few times. And of course, every time that we did, we uh, made sure to uh, to come over and visit Harry and, and see me and, and spend time with, with them. And, you know, I because of see me and who she was and how she sounded, I always called her my earth angel. And she really was my, my earth angel. Harry and Simi met uh, while she was at the nursery. Harry was a courier for the Jewish council and, and the nursery. And he would go back and forth with instructions and information between the two. And that's how the two of them uh, met. Actually in uh, September of 1943, uh, the Germans didn't have any didn't have any need for the nursery anymore because by that time most of the Jews in Amsterdam and in Holland had been rounded up and, and sent to the to the different camps and so they decided to close the uh, nursery across the street and uh, so uh, Simi and, and Harry secretly got married so they could go into hiding which they did, and they went into hiding for two years until after, after the war. Um, Sini told me that uh, she handed me to people from the resistance who in turn took me over to the Lom family. I, before I get into that, I also wanted to explain that the children that uh, she was going to put into uh, uh, other homes uh, what she would do is she would send a message to the resistance. And if they had a dark haired child, the, the resistance would send a message to the uh, south of uh, Holland to the different ministers and priests saying that we had a supply of coffee. And if they had a blonde haired child, they would, the resistance would send a message messengers to the uh, different priests and ministers in the uh, south of in the north of north of uh, Holland and say that they had a supply of tea and this is a way that uh, they were able to get the, the children who looked like the other children in the area hidden during during the war anyway Sini got handed me to people from the resistance who in turn took me to the Lom family in Hilversum. And this is the Lom family. This is my war family from August 1942 to 45. Uh, Johan Lom and his wife, uh, Henrika. Now, Johan Lom, the father was a plumber and had met and befriended my father through the family sanitary supply business. They must have discussed the possibility of what might happen with the Germans. And Johann Lom told my father, if need be, Johann and his family would take care of little Louis, me. My parents were sent to Westerbrook on August 10th, 1942 from the theater and from there, fairly quickly, they were transported by train and cattle cars to Auschwitz, where they were murdered on September 30th, 1942. I lived with the Lom family during the war when people would ask Eureka Lom, the mother, who the baby was. They were told that I was the illegitimate baby from her sister. The Loms had two children, 
during that time, a boy named Andre, this is Andre, uh, and a girl, a younger girl, one year younger than me, named Betty. They raised me as one of their own. I do, I do not I do not have much of a memory of that time. I was only 14 months old when I went to live with them, but I do rem remember making the sign of the cross and uh, uh, seeing Germans with guns in the streets. Years later, when I met when I went back to to Holland for the first time and met the Loms as a grown-up. And that was that picture before. I was actually 24 years old. And it was 1963 when I first met the Loms as, as, an, uh, as an adult. Uh, one of the stories they told me was I would go with the mother to pick up Andre from Catholic nursery school. She had to be very careful not to let any of the nurses take me to the bathroom. They could see I was circumcised and there, and therefore gave away my Jewish identity. They were very brave people living with the fear that if they were found out hiding a Jewish child, the whole family would be killed. I nominated Johanni Rika Lam for the righteous as they were honored posthumously, the righteous among the nations, May 7th, 1942, via Yahweh Shem. Uh, for, you, for you out there who may not know, Yahweh Shem is a multi-acre memorial to the Holocaust in World War II in Israel. And one of the areas they have set aside is the uh, righteous among the nations. And it's these large blocks, giant blocks that have the names of uh, the, each country. And uh, under the names engraved are the uh, names of the, the righteous people who saved Jewish adults, children, and so forth for no monetary gain, only to, because they were good people and for the, the, the morals and, and, and keeping people alive and, you know, making sure that people were, were taken care of as, as best they could. Johan and Enrique had three more children after the war. As I grew, as I grew as an adult, Andrew and I, Andre, the oldest child. Here I'm about four, I think. Andre's about six. And this picture is taken many years later when I would come and visit uh, Andre and about at the same place where we were, the first picture was taken. He would, uh, he, he always referred to me as his little brother. Today I'm still close to all their children and to some children and to some of the children's children. They even called me Uncle Lou. You know, it was so nice. Every time we came to Holland, you know, I, I notified Andre that I was coming. And the day that I would go to uh, Andre's and his wife, Rina's house, uh, all, all his siblings would be there with, with, in a lot of cases with their children. And that's how I got to meet them all and got to know more about their family and got close to their family. And this occurred, I don't know, four or five, six different different times. And it was just great being, you know, being part of them. And and like I said, I, I always considered being them being my war family. And uh, this is a picture of uh, me where my life started. Uh, life started anew. Me, Uncle Al, Hoppy, who was dad at that time, and Aunt Betty, Rebecca Cohen was mom. This is a picture 
of the three of us. And uh, when we just after the war, when we started to live together as uh, one as one family. I'm five years old, and I can say my life was finally starting. The first part of my life is pretty much a blur, and it was just, you know, survival. But now I'm living in Bussum. Bussum is a small town right next to uh, Hilversum with my Aunt Betty, my father's sister, and her husband, Uncle Abraham Oppie Cohen. They were, they were, they are the only ones who survived the camps. They were in hiding with both of their parents, Oppie's brother and sister and husband. They were hiding in a two room, two story shack behind a person's home in, in, in Hilversum. They, once we got caught going to Switzerland, the family went into hiding and they found this, uh, this uh, shack uh, behind Derek's home in, in Hilversum where he let them stay. And, and it was literally two rooms and it did have an attic. So it was like almost almost three rooms. Uh, they were in hiding with both of their parents and Oppie's brothers and sister, brother and sister and her husband. When it was all said and done, they were in hiding in this two room, uh, two story, uh, person's home. All in all, there were 17 people hiding when it was all, all over. They were hiding for over two years until they were found by the Germans on April 3rd, 1944. Another picture of Oppie and me. And like I said, it, 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 it was the, the best of times. My aunt and uncle, Oppie and Al, were the only survivors from their family, except for a few cousins who escaped Holland before the Germans came in. My uncle Oppie, Al, lost everybody from his family. He was the only survivor. Me, I was in seventh heaven. I had a home for the first time, a real home that I could feel as, anyway, you know, it's five, six years, five years old. Mom and dad, Biddy and Al, became my mom and dad. I had good food. Food was a big thing for me. I mean, for any child, food's very important, very important. And the Germans just, you know, took all our food all the time and, and sent it back to, to Germany. So there was very little food. And, and I became very suspicious of food for a long, long time. And to a certain extent, still am to, to a certain extent, because most food that I received during the war, it just didn't taste good. It was grisly, it was fatty, God knows what I was eating. In fact, there were times where they sent me to bed and the food was still in my mouth. And when I woke up, they told me the food was still there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even uh, swallow it. I had warm clothes. Uh, which were sent over for, uh, from America by Elsie and Ike. Uh, that's why we all look so good. And I went to school, I got glasses, I saw fireworks, living for real for the first time. It was great to say the least. But it really wasn't, you know, it was great for me and I was having a wonderful time and, and, and so forth. But it was really difficult for my uncle, my uncle Al, because he had lost everybody. He was the only surviving member of, of his entire family, brother, sister, mom and dad, everybody was gone ex except for him. And we, you know, we lived like this for a couple of years and kept receiving care packages from Elsie and Ike. And, telling us that we should come to America and start our lives with, the, with them. And then finally, Oppie just said, you know, I, I just can't take you here any longer. We're gonna do that. We're gonna come to America and we're gonna start over and we're gonna live, start with Elsie and, and Ike. And so in the uh, beginning of February in 1948, we decided to come to America. Got 
and tickets to a luxury liner called the New Amsterdam uh, out of uh, Rotterdam. And here's a picture of my passport. And it shows that uh, we arrived and uh, was admitted in, uh, in New York on February 1st, 1948. On that boat, I, one of the nice things on that boat that I saw my first cowboy picture. Never, I enjoyed it a lot, never saw any cowboy pictures in Holland. And that's where I saw my first uh, cowboy picture. Here's a picture of Elsie and Ike, Elsie being my mom's sister and her husband, Ike. Um, they met a little while after Elsie had come to America and they had uh, gotten married and then had a son, like I said, named Alan. Both, both of us born on the same day, June 21st, one year apart, uh, me in Holland and him in Brooklyn, New York. Anyway, Ike met us at the boat in, uh, in, in February of 48, took us to a big steak dinner. Uh, don't really remember much about that, except I remember in Times Square, seeing all the billboards and all the lights and, and uh, the movements of the billboards and the colors of the neon. I thought it was cartoons on building, buildings. I'd never seen anything like, like that before. So we had the dinner and then the next morning we took the train with Ike to Atlanta, Georgia, where Elsie and Ike and, and Alan were living at the time. And the uh, two families uh, moved in together and we lived together like that for a little bit over a year in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, I was only six, seven years old actually seven years old at the time. Uh, but I guess business wasn't that good and, and the family decided that uh, we, we would leave Atlanta, Georgia and we would make our way across country to uh, Los Angeles, to California, where we thought there was, the men thought there was more opportunity uh, for us. So in, in 1949, Ike had this 1936 Buick limousine and we all piled into it. The four adults, Elsie and Ike, uh, Betty and Al, and Betty was pregnant. And that was a miraculous thing in its own right, because when uh, Elsie, when, excuse me, when Betty and her family were captured after in hiding and she was sent to Auschwitz, Instead of the gas chambers, she was sent to the uh, to the hospital where she was experimented on along with other females uh, by Dr. Mingler, uh, and they were experimented on so they would not have any more. They would be uh, they would uh, they wouldn't have any more Jewish uh, children. They uh, they were what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, doesn't come to mind, but uh, yeah, their their they were man, organs were manipulated so they would uh, be sterile. That's the name I was looking for. But something happened and it didn't quite take place to Aunt Betty. And so in Atlanta, Georgia, Aunt Betty uh, got pregnant and uh, had her baby uh, a couple of weeks after we landed here in in Los Angeles. So it was the four adults, one being pregnant, Alan and I, the two children, my dog Skippy, which I had brought all the way from, from Holland, and all our, all our belongings were all loaded up into this 1936 limousine. Some of you out there might be familiar with the Beverly Hillbillies TV show, and at the beginning it shows them piling into their Model T and all their belongings and so forth. Well, we were a little bit more sophisticated looking than that, but that was the idea of all of our stuff and all our belongings all were in, uh, in, 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 uh, in this car. And we came to uh, Los Angeles in May of uh, 1949. And uh, the first thing that Ike wanted to show us when we got to Los Angeles 
he wanted us to see the Pacific Ocean. So we uh, drove down Wilshire Boulevard to Santa Monica and uh, saw, the, uh, saw the Santa Monica Bay and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I was, uh, thought that was a, a great scene and that's the way we would start our, our time here in Los Angeles. And then we had to go find a place to live. And so we came back up Wilshire Boulevard and at 17th at Wilshire was a motel called uh, the Red Apple Motel at 17th and Wilshire in Santa Monica. And that's where the two families uh, uh, spent the next three or four months. We lived together in, at this motel and the men, uh, uh, Al and Ike, went out to get work. And basically uh, from their past, they, they were in the apparel, a garment trade uh, as a cutter and pattern maker. And they went to downtown uh, LA and, and, and got work and uh, uh, started, the, started our lives here in Los Angeles. After like three or four months, the, the families decided that they would you know, start on their own. They, they would live on their own. And it was decided that, uh, that I would go live with uh, Elsie and Ike, my aunt and uncle, uh, because uh, they had a boy, Alan, my age. And it, was, it would be an easier transition for me to go live with them instead of my mom and dad uh, Betty and Al, who had just brand new baby Jerry, uh, and, and, uh, instead of living with them. So it was a little bit awkward and a little confusing for me. Nobody asked my opinion, obviously. I was what, eight years old at the time. I was, you know, I did what I was told and, uh, uh, and I went to live with uh, Elsie and Ike. And so, uh, you know, I would, call up uh, Biddy and Al, uh, my mom and dad, and talk to them on the phone and go visit them uh, every weekend and, and so forth. And eventually it all worked out and Elsie and I became mom and dad and uh, Betty and Al became uh, aunt and, my aunt and, and, and uncle. Uh, here is a picture of uh, Elsie and Ike, uh, Alan and me and Aunt Betty and Jerry, about three, four months old. This is our first home in LA after the Red Apple Motel. Uh, we lived in an apartment uh, right off of Los Feliz uh, Boulevard at the border of uh, LA and Glendale. And uh, uh, Betty and, and Jerry and, and Al had another place uh, on Third Street uh, towards downtown. Another picture two years later of Elsie and uh, Al in 1951 and Alan and myself. And then here's one more picture with uh, Alan. He's age 13 here. Uh, this is me at age 12, Jerry at uh, age four and Aunt Betty. And uh, this was uh, Oppie and uh, Al's uh, Al's and uh, Betty's new car, uh, brand new Plymouth. This was on Vine Street, just above uh, Melrose. There was a court there with a bunch of different bungalows and that's where El uh, Betty and Al moved into. And uh, so this is the cars parked right in front of their bungalow. And just so it happens, there was a lot of Dutch uh, uh, people living in those bungalows also and some, some of those Dutch people, uh, Betty had uh, had met in in camp and 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 on the death march, and it, it was nice that it was like the the community all for them uh, living uh, there in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, we uh, we went to school. Uh, you know, when I went to school, I when I came to America, I only knew I only knew yes or no, and then because of Alan, I also learned me too, 
because whatever Alan had, I wanted her also. So my English was uh, very, very poor and very basic and about the same right now, to tell you the truth. Anyway, uh, when I uh, when, we, when we started school, they they put me back into kindergarten instead of first grade, and that's how I kind of learned the language. I learned it through the kid, the kids playing and being around the uh, other children. Uh, obviously, living with uh, Elsie and Ike, who didn't speak Dutch, uh, only spoke English, and and in, in the house, and and. Uh, um, you know, picked up my English uh, that way. I never really had any formal training. I learned some English in school, but basically uh, just uh, picked it up uh, as I went along. Math was my strong subject because I, I even long, I learned math. I remember math and going to school in uh, Hilversum after the war. And, you know, numbers don't change two and two equal four, no matter what language. It may be called something else, but the principles are the same. So with math, I had no problem and I was very good in math, but English and things like that, uh, it was much more difficult for me. Uh, whoop, went too far. Uh, when I was 16, um, it, it, they decided that I should become an American citizen just like the rest of them were becoming American citizen. The only ones that really didn't need to become citizens was uh, Alan, who was born in Brooklyn, and Jerry, who was born here in Los, Los Angeles. Uh, by the way, Jerry was named after Al's uh, brother, named Jerry. And Biddy and Al, also a couple of years after Jerry, after we were here a couple of years, had a daughter named uh, Hetty, who uh, was named after Elsie's uh, uh, Elsie's sister. Uh, so they, you know, I, and instead of getting, instead of going through all the rigmaroles roles of getting my citizenship. Uh, I, I was still 16, and, and so if I was formally adopted, then I could just become a citizen of the United States. So in, uh, in uh, 19, uh, when was this, in 1956, I guess, uh, 57, uh, I officially became uh, Lewis Corper Fogelman, and this is a picture of my naturalization papers and how my, my last name Corper became my middle name. So my name as of today is Lewis Corper Fogelman. Um, and obviously I grew up and lived with Elsie and Ike and Alan. And in 1989, Alan, Alan and I threw uh, Elsie a big party for our 75th birthday. And this is a picture of myself and Alan and uh, Elsie at the age of, uh, of 75. Great party. I had gotten married and uh, this is a picture of Alan and myself and my son Ira. Uh, Ira I named after my dad Israel and I gave him the middle name Corper so I could keep the last name, our last name going. So Ira's name became officially Ira Corper Fogelman. And uh, Ira blessed me a few years after he got married with two wonderful grandchildren. First came uh, Abigail. She's 13 today in the eighth grade and doing great and looking great. and. Just uh, a nice, wonderful, all-around uh, young lady. And a couple of years after that, uh, Ira and Olivia, that's uh, Ira's wife's name, uh, had a son who he named Aiden. And he gave Aiden the family as his middle name. 
And so Aiden's full name is Aiden Corpor Fogelman. So the name of Corpor lives on through myself and Ira and Aiden, and hopefully for many more generations to come would be somewhat of a tradition in my family. You know, I, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, I guess. I also had a daughter. Her name, uh, here she is with, with, with me, her name is Heidi. I named her after my, my mom, Herta. Uh, Heidi uh, is a career lady. She's never gotten uh, married. She's uh, worked for Ticketmaster for over 30 years now and has had quite a career with them. She's uh, worked uh, four different Olympics around the world uh, for Ticketmaster, a couple of Nora girls in Washington, DC, a bunch of other different events uh, throughout uh, the country. And uh, for example, uh, one, one summer, she was the uh, ticketing, uh, the traveling ticketing manager for the Rolling Stones as they uh, went on, on tour. So she's had quite a career and a lot of uh, uh, fun, exciting things that uh, she's uh, been a part of. Uh, I have to say that, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. I am very lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones not only to survive, but to have these wonderful people in my life. I mean, for the first eight years of my life, I had four sets of parents. I had my real mom and dad for the first 14 months of my life. Then I had the war, my war family, um, Johan and Rita Lam and their children. And then I went to live with uh, Betty and Al, when my life really started. And then we came to America and uh, Elsa and Ike became my parents. So I had, I had uh, four sets of parents and, you know, they all loved me and, and helped me survive and, and, and to grow. Uh, and, 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 you know, I never felt like an orphan. Uh, Oppie, especially Oppie. Oppie talked, Al talked about the war and, 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 you know, what took place and how it happened. And that's why I knew a lot about it because he talked about it openly and my part of it and my parents part of it and Elsie and Ike's and, and so forth. And, you know, the Holocaust is just part of our DNA and just part of our lives. And, 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 and that's, uh, how we've uh, we've treated it. Uh, after I uh, went to school and uh, I went to uh, college and I went to a business college because like I said before I was I was good in math but not so great at English so I went to a business college called uh, Woodbury College and when I went there, their camp was in downtown LA on, on 6th Street by the freeway. Today, they have a beautiful campus in, in, in Burbank. But uh, I went, went there and got my, my bachelor's in accounting. Even though I, I didn't want to become a CPA, I wanted to go into business. I knew that uh, you know if I was going to go into business, I, I had to know what the numbers were. We're all about, and that's why, uh, besides numbers being a lot easier than English, I uh, I became an uh, accountant from uh, from a business standpoint. Uh, you know, I, I I've been like I said very fortunate, and and you know, I think one of the reasons why I've I've been, I've been so lucky in my life is that. You know, even though God put me in a strange place and, and gave me some tough times at the beginning, he, he kind of made up for it uh, during my life and kind of looked out for me. And uh, one of the things that he, he, he kind of helped make happen was that 
I caught this wave called the music business. And it was a heck of a way that I, I, I rode all the way in through my career. Uh, and uh, I started the, in the music business in 1966 in, uh, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. I worked for four years in San Francisco in different parts of the, uh, of the music business and then came to LA and worked for another company uh, in, the, in the music business. And uh, so I had an eight year uh, uh, business, Harvard business education in the music business. And, and it was quite exciting because the music business was just starting to, to grow during the, those years. And I, I became part of that. And then in 74, I thought that I could uh, start a music chain of my own and myself and a couple of, of uh, partners started a uh, chain called Music Plus. And we opened four stores in uh, November of 1974. And those four stores we grew until uh, and these, until 1993 when we had 96 stores operating all in California and we sold those to uh, Blockbuster Video that used my chain Music Plus as an as entree into the music uh, business. The other thing that uh, happened to me with the music business is that uh, I met my, uh, the love of my life uh, and uh, Again, this this was God had a hand in this because I kept saying that this this was shared because Anna was on the west coast on the east coast. She was born in New Jersey and worked in New York and, and involved in advertising and research and marketing. And me, I was a west coast uh, guy living on the west coast and uh, through the music business. Uh, we met and uh, we had a five year bi coastal uh, relationship. And finally, in, uh, in uh, 87, uh, I convinced her to marry me. And uh, she and I just uh, celebrated our 33rd uh, year together in September of, uh, of this year. So why am I doing and telling you all of this? Well, the uh, the main reasons, as is stated on the, on this, is to teach, uh, so that uh, we never forget that uh, that this took place, and for you to hear firsthand, so you do not believe those who deny that this never happened. You know, the, the, believe me, this took place, and six million Jews were murdered and many, many of us was displaced and, and uh, God knows where we, we, we ended up. I also do this to be an ambassador for those who cannot speak anymore and to show the importance of helping others because without the help of all these people and so many other people and not, not just me, you know, we wouldn't be here today. And it's so important to, to do things for other people, big or small, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's important to, to help our fellow man and, and to, to, from the smallest to the biggest things. I also tell the story to help to stop the hate of all kinds that we have in today's world be it Jews, uh, anti-Semitism, black, brown, Asian, whatever the color might be. Uh, it's important to, to talk about this and, and hopefully we can put the hate aside. And of course, the most important reason why I'm here and, and I am telling the story is to honor my, my Aunt Betty, uh, a survivor who uh, in March of uh, next year, not too long from now, will turn to turn to be a hundred. 
she's doing great. She's uh, 99. She stopped uh, talking uh, about a year and a half ago, up to the, that time for the last 40 plus years. She talked at the Holocaust Museum, uh, at the Museum of Tolerance. Uh, she uh, talked to many uh, law enforcement class groups and classes and so forth. And, uh, you know, to keep that uh, going that, that she started, I, I started talking uh, myself to tell our story because uh, she instilled in me the importance for people to hear about us uh, firsthand. I'm also very fortunate to have all these pictures that somehow got saved uh, for us uh, during after the war. Uh, two other things that 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 we got that uh, somehow were saved were two diaries that uh, my my grandfather kept one during the two years that that uh, he was in hiding, and my uncle Al kept one during the two years that uh, that that he was in hiding, and. Uh, this is the first page uh, of my uncle Al's uh, diary, dated uh, uh, Hilversum, October 26, 1942. It begins at, uh, at, it says at the beginning, at the, as I begin this diary, 103 days have already passed since I have withdrawn from a life in society. It's kind of amazing to re read through this. Uh, but there's one part that I really want to share with you, and it, it's right here. It says, this is Oppie talking. Although I had often heard tales from, German, from the German Jews, I did not believe them. Here began my mistake, which I now perceive. I lived alongside reality and did not interest myself into politics but politics was interested in me. And I just think that this statement that he made back in 1943 is so apropos and just as important today and what all the things that are happening today with them, people, all the immigrants at the border, the separation of the children and so forth, and I just think it's uh, just amazing that he wrote this and, and that uh, it's still uh, important and very much uh, a part of today. And that's my story. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I'd be glad to, uh, to an answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lou, for sharing your story with us. Um, and uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, one of our viewers um, is actually a survivor in our community would like that sentence typed out. And what I would like to do is I can, I would like to type it in our Facebook comments. So afterwards, Erica, I can send it to you um, because I agree that it is such a profound statement on your uncle's part um and i think it's a really important way to end your story while um while we're waiting for anybody to ask some questions i would also just like to share with everybody that um about two years ago lou spoke at the museum with his aunt betty and they both shared the story together which was really um really a special experience to listen to both of them. Thank Steve, goodness we have the video of it too. It's yes, a nice as a matter of fact, I see Betty's son who I'm listening in the audience. Um, Love you, Aunt Betty. Yes, we, um, and again, like I said, um, you know, you your family is such an integral part of our museum and of our educational programs and so many students have heard these, um, your story and Betty's story. 
Um, we have a, um, some questions for you. When you were growing up in the United States, did you talk to your friends about your experiences or about where you were born? Well, I definitely told them where I was born. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I didn't know my story as well as I do today. And, and I, you know, I learned about myself and, and my story and my family over the years, mostly from my, from my uncle. And so basically I just told my, uh, my, uh, my friends that I was from Holland and that I came in, in, in 48 and, and, uh, and uh, I'm living with my mom and dad because that's what I called Elsie and I can. I never went into any real detail until uh, much later, and and uh, and in fact, I really didn't really talk about it much until I, I was inspired by my aunt Betty to start sharing my my story, and I really didn't start sharing it and uh, and until I started talking at the museum and to the different uh, classes and children and couple of cases, uh, colleges, and kind of snowballed from there. Thank you. And also to those of you watching on Zoom, if you check the chat, um, we just linked the, the talk of Lou and Betty sharing their story together, which we'll do on Facebook as well. Um, let's see, we have some more questions. Um, something that stands out to me that you have always said to students, despite everything that you and your family went through, you always tell students that you consider yourself to be a very fortunate person, um, given the fact that you know, that you had were surrounded by such loving family after the war. Can you talk a little bit about that sentiment and about, um, you know, the way that you feel afterwards and that you've felt since then? Uh, that's the hard part. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, most, most of the, my time during the war, I was, a, I was a baby. And so I, I, didn't have a lot of verbal verbalization uh, skills. Uh, most of them, most of uh, the skills I had were were non-communication, a lot of crying. I'm a good crier, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I as, when I watch a movie or something that has a lot of warmth and a lot of good feelings those feelings come back inside me and I, I kind of, you know, tear up a little bit inside and, and, and because they're so meaningful and, and, and they were so warm and, and, and I'm so grateful for those feelings and for those memories. And, and you know, and, and they stick with me today. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm a good person uh, and because I think the reason I became a good person is because of all these people in my life, my, my regular parents, my poor family, uh, they're, they're just so warm, wonderful people who, who, who lived life the way it should be live, lived by helping each other and taking care of each other and uh, doing the best we can for, for each other. And, and humanity uh, as a whole, and uh, so I, I I cry easy. I you know, it's a wonderful life. The the movie with Jimmy Stewart and uh, and um, and uh, Donna Reed. You know, I watch that that movie's on every year at Christmas time, and I watch that movie every time, and I cry every single time because it's it, that warmth and that family and that that whole belonging uh, in those scenes are just, just takes, just grabs me from the inside. And, you know, other movies that are like that, 
just grabbed me from the inside and I, I, I just like movies like that and like that, that feeling. Thank you. And I, I agree. That's a wonderful film. We have some more questions um, from members of the audience. When you were um, you being raised by your aunt and uncle, was it difficult for you to be raised by so many different families at a young age? Surprisingly, it wasn't. You know, uh, again, I, I think uh, there was confusion in my own mind, uh, which I just didn't understand. But I, I think I was too young to, to really un to really fully understand, and and because I, I they showed me so much love, I didn't. Uh, and like I said, I never felt like an orphan. That that it wasn't that difficult. Uh, as far as, and, and thank goodness to, to my uncle Al, you know, it was never hidden from me. I always knew, I didn't always comprehend, but as I got older, I comprehended more and more. And, and, and so I feel very fortunate uh, that it wasn't as difficult as it could have been and as others might have, have had it. Uh, and it, I, I contributed to all the, the wonderful people in my life then and now that, uh, that made it so. Thank you very much. Um, and before we read the next question, I just want to read a comment from um, another child survivor of the Holocaust who was listening. She says, you may not have actual memories, but your body remembers. There's no doubt about that. I agree. Yeah, it's, it's funny how, you know, you, 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 you have certain senses, like I have a very good uh, visceral uh, part of me. I, I, I'm, I'm good at, um, I, have, I have good visceral instincts. And, and I, I really, I came from, as as a baby, because again, I couldn't speak. I didn't really have the language and, uh, or to know the language. And, and so, you know, my instincts and, and my surviving uh, inner words come from the visceral feelings that I uh, developed uh, as a child. And it was all feelings really. So she's very right. Thank you. Um... And another question. In thinking about this today, how did you find your peace with the things that you suffered through in your early life? You know, again, it, it's the love. It, it, it's really that, that and, and the wonderful people that are in my life then are, and that are in my life now. And the openness, we talked about it. We didn't hide the fact. We, we, didn't, we didn't make something out of it that it wasn't. We, we talked about what it was and who it was and how it was. And, and, and so there was no mystery. And, and so I was able to, you know, as I got older, to, to uh, be able to understand and come to grips with it. Even though there's a lot of anxieties and feelings and 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 uh, confusion at times, uh, I have a pretty clear picture today. And even though those anxieties and those feelings are, are still with me and bother me to a certain extent, at least I know why they bother me and I know why they're there and I can deal with them that way. Of course, my Aunt Betty was a big help in all of that also. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned um, a little bit about living after the war with both, um, with both of your sets of aunts and uncles. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your family, how those two families uh, combined and how they were, um, you know, how close they were with each mm -hmm. other? You know, I, when we first came to America, I mean, they were close because we were family and that was the only family we had. And, and, and so, you know, you expected that they would be close and 
we you know we lived together and and even though Elsie and Ike didn't go for the Holocaust, Ike was you know sent away when he was 13. He was from Russia to, uh, during the pogroms, and so from the age of 13 on, he he was on 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 his own. And of course, Elsie experienced some of that by being sent away when when she was uh, quite young and came to America uh, on on uh, on her own. And uh, unfortunately, the men, Al and Ike, died way too young because of the war and, and the hardships that they had. And so they, they were both, uh, uh, they both left us uh, in 73 and in 74. And, in, and, and with that, Elsie and Betty who were really sister-in-laws became sisters. They became very, very close. And so anytime we did anything as a family, even though we did the same thing together as a family, we, they, they became even closer and they did everything together. They, they, they traveled together, they, 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 they didn't live together, they, but they lived in the same, in the same building and, and uh, you know, they, so the, the two families just grew up together and it became a natural instinct to be uh, as close as we are. And we, all the kids uh, of, the, of the two families are, are very close. You know, we started out as six coming across country and today without in-laws, we're something like 38, 49, 40 people. So uh, it's been a good trip. Thank you very much. Um, we have just several comments with people saying thank you um, for sharing your story. Somebody actually commented on our Facebook page that her son had listened to your Aunt Betty speak and he wrote a paper on her for his English class. Um, and uh, I think a nice co um, comment to end on is somebody, one of our audience members said, thank you for this. I look forward to sharing your story with others. And just so, um, for you to conclude, what special message do you like to give uh, young students when you speak to them? I know you speak to a lot of middle school students, so 13, 14 year olds. Yeah. I I, I try to tell them that uh, if they see something that's wrong, that they should say something. Don't just let it pass by. Yeah, you know, if they can't do something about it themselves or don't want to do something about it themselves, they should make themselves heard to their parents, to their school counselors, to their teachers. Don't let it just be there. And, and, and because that just makes it worse. And the other thing I try to tell them is to be passionate. Be passionate in what you do. Passion gets you a long way. It makes life a lot more interesting and, and, and you have a better chance of being successful if what you do, you're passionate at it. And so I think passion is a very important factor and uh, and being successful in life, and and uh, you know be a good person and help each other and uh, always be on the lookout because uh, life is uh, not always going to hand you a cherry. Well, thank you so much again, Lou, for sharing your story with us. Um, as we mentioned. Your, your family has been so integral to our education programs and we are so grateful. We're so grateful for everything you do and that your aunt has done and does for our museum. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Take care. We're wishing everybody a happy, healthy and safe weekend. And uh, um, please join, feel free to join us for all of our virtual programs. We have Holocaust survivors speak every Thursday 
Um, we have Dr. Raul Artal speaking a week from today. Thursday is at 11 a.m. Thank you so much again, Lou, and to our audience, thank you for your attention. Thank you all for joining us.